You're listening to Medina Mondays with your host, Henry J. Medina. We did it. My name is Henry J. Medina. Thank you so much for that intro, Matt. That's my my buddy, Matthew Herrera. You guys can follow him on Twitter at LASX underscore P. That's the LA Sports Express official page. I'm going to be partnering with him in the future. Keep that, ma- that name in mind. So, like I said, my name is Henry J. Medina. Guys, follow the discussion. Let's get this going. Let's blow this up. We're going to blow up M- Medina Mondays as big as possible. If you know me personally, I've wanted my own podcast for a long time. It's been a long time in the making. Heck, it's been a long time. It's been a long, long day. Um, Follow me on Twitter, at TD Gauchos. I'm a proud Gaucho UCSB alum. Follow the show on Twitter at Medina Mondays. Also look up our Facebook pages, our Instagram pages, same Twitter handles, at TD Gauchos and at Medina Mondays. You guys know the deal. So, like I said, if you know me, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. And we finally did it, guys. Started from the bottom. Now we're here. Our show is going to be strictly sports, sports, pop culture. Wow, that sounded really contradictory. Someone edit that out. Anyways, so I'm a SoCal native, born and raised Orange County, straight out of Anaheim, proud Catella football alum. Go Knights! CIF. Southern Regional Division 11 champions. Really proud of those boys. You might have to see some of the coaches on here on the show. Um, so, yeah, we're going to keep it. We're going to be a little more biased to the West Coast. We know some other sports networks, some other sports shows. They like to kick things east of the Mississippi. We're not going to do that. We're going to stick to the guys here on the West Coast. Rep the West, rep the West Coast well. Guys, give me some more street cred on Twitter, on the Facebook, on the Instagram represent and uh yeah that's a little bit about me a little bit about the show we'll see how long this one goes this is episode one it's gonna be awful it's gonna be really bad i'm I'm letting you guys know right now there's gonna be some stuttering there's gonna be some licking of the lips that's really disgusting i know but my lip my mouth's gonna be really dry through this hour hour and a half of a show um go ahead critique me on all those social media uh, web pages and and sites like I said it's at TD Gauchos on Twitter face uh, in, and Instagram and at Medina Mondays on Twitter you can find our Facebook page and our Instagram page got a cute picture of my dog Mookie shout out to you Mookie Mookie's outside chilling right now he's got his red sweater repping the show repping the show colors I'm watch I'm wearing the game day red just like Tiger you know t- we're gonna talk about Tiger this week or today I mean about this past weekend and last week is he back? Is the man back? A lot of you guys don't know. Tiger Woods grew up in SoCal, went to Western. That's also in Anaheim. We're here in Medina Studios in Anaheim. So, man, Tiger Woods is the comeback for real. We saw two great nights, excuse me, two great tournaments out of Tiger the last couple weekends past weekend Arnold Palmer Invitational everyone knows Tiger loves playing the Arnold Palmer Invitational he's had some memorable moments he's had many victories there he he said in an interview afterward that he was sad not sad but he wished he could have played when Arnie was uh you know in his passing mo- in his passing days passing years but you know how that goes you you know you know the wife beats your car and with the golf club yeah, you find five drugs in your system. Don't know where you are. I think you're in California and you're driving on down a street in the middle of the night in Florida. You, you know, the usual, the usual. But anyways, Tiger tied for fifth this weekend and was one stroke the prior weekend from winning the Valspar tournament. Man, that Valspar tournament was pretty interesting. Did you guys see the Valspar uh, paint cans? Those were the tee box markers. thought that was a pretty cool uh, little, uh, little gimmick. But anyways, Tiger finished fifth this weekend shot a uh, 10 under at the Arnold Palmer Invitational his biggest uh his worst round that we uh, this past week was on Friday where he only managed to shoot par he was looking really good on Thursday shot 
uh, under four under. Came back, like I said, with the even par score on Friday. Shot under uh, three under on Saturday and three under on Sunday. And Rory McIlroy, who, you know, come on, let's be real here. No one's no one was really talking about much about Rory McIlroy those last couple weeks when Tigers on the prowl. When the Tigers on the prowl, the Tigers got to eat. Didn't get to eat this past weekend. But Royal McIlroy had a great Sunday going eight under with eight birdies. He had a big putt on the 18th. It was a par four from 25 feet out. Just lined it up perfectly. It was a perfect exclamation point, a perfect cherry on top to seal his victory. And on the 15th, the 15th par four, he had a beautiful chip in from about 20, 25 feet out as well. And it's totally stole the thunder from everyone on the, on the golf course. It wasn't even close. I believe the next second place finisher was let me find that for you folks here we go the next place finisher was i believe three points behind three uh strokes behind excuse me man my stats and info team oh wait that's me is so bad yeah so we had bob de chambu Bryson, excuse me, Bryson, Bryson to Chambu only shot five under on the day. So Roy on that big Sunday, huge Sunday, eight under on the day, took the took the prize, took the purse home that weekend. And let's get back to this Valspar tournament. Tiger hit nine under at the par 71 Valspar Classic. Shot an, uh, one under on Thursday, three under on Friday, four under on Saturday, and a one under on Sunday one stroke shy just didn't hit just didn't hit enough putts his putting hasn't been where it's been in the past you know putting is a very mental part of the game and with so much in tiger's life right now it's not you know makes sense why it's not back into form, but it's great to see Tiger finishing tournaments. He's really what made golf the last 20, 25 years what it is. That's crazy to think that Tiger was winning tournaments when I was five years old, 1999, 1998. No, excuse me, 97 is when Tiger Woods started, uh, who's on the prowl, doing crazy things on the golf course, doing things on the golf on the golf course no one's ever seen before and in dramatic fashion. And that's why people talk about Tiger Woods. I don't I didn't like the haters this weekend talking about, you know, there's other people uh to interesting in golf to watch. And I my response is that like who? Like who? No no one cares that much about Royal Michael World. Let's all be real. Anybody who's anybody has an opinion or knows the name T. Gray Woods. But let's recap the controversy. The last tour victory Tiger Woods was had was in 2013. He had a terrible 2014 and 2015 due to injury. He took 2016 off with because of that same back injury. And had to be carted off. Two thousand nine, go back even farther, is when his wife and the world found out that this man gets more women than any other man in any other sport, which was a big shock to the world. We all know Tiger isn't always the most appropriate guy on the golf course, isn't always the most stoic man on the golf course. He pumps his fists. He always is excited or he's always disgusted when he misses a shot. So fast forward to just last year where he was pulled over in Florida. Uh, he was found uh, completely asleep not knowing where he was, 
for uh, uh, not allegedly but suspe suspected of driving under the influence pulled over on the side of the road flat tires dancing his bumpers in his, his front bumper and the toxicology report comes back with five different drugs in his system so if you don't like the guy i get it it's not exactly a, a role model to your kids unless you're a strict golf purist i suppose if you don't follow anybody or care about anybody's off the field issues hey that's your deal and you know I don't know if I'd fall in that category, but I have always been impressed with what Tiger Woods has been able to do with a club and a little white golf ball. And I'm just impressed that he has come this far from injuries, suspected drug abuse, because let's face it, five drugs in your system, there's no, there wasn't no unexpected reaction to medication or or uh, prescription drugs that you didn't know about. You were taking five different substances, some that shouldn't be talked about on G and PG radio. And then when you're pulled over by the police to uh, cite the alphabet in a non uh, non rhythmic, non sing sing like uh, manner. And you ask the officer, you don't want me to sing the national anthem backwards? You know your mind is gone. So I'm just impressed that Tiger Woods is back in tournaments, finishing tournaments, finishing strong. And the Masters only uh, two, two and a half weeks away. First week of April, Tiger Woods looks like he is set to make his major debut and Let's let's see if he can pull out another victory. Uh, if he doesn't win this next week, I'm not sure if he's playing this weekend, um, the next tournament. But if he wins the Masters, that'll be his 80th tour win and be a huge milestone for him. He's been stuck at 79 for a long time, for over five years. And I'm sure he's looking forward to picking up number 80 moving right along that's enough of mr tiger woods that uh local golfing legend yes he's a local local if you're from anaheim from the la area from the orange county scene moving right along to rams football something near and dear to my heart and NFL free agency and trades. You know, the NFL free agency period, the the off season, the draft has always, always hyped me up as a kid. I'm a big fan of the off season because in the off season of the NFL, and you know, in all major sports, the hype is the hype is real. So you feel as a fan, obviously doesn't always transpose because every all 32 teams in the NFL, all 30 teams in baseball, all 30-odd teams in the NFL and 30 teams in the NBA believe they could win it because they made such and such move, they traded for such and such player, and drafted so-and-so out of, out of that college from the little corner of some state that we never heard of in Canada. Anyways, so Rams football brought to you unofficially by Dick Sporting Goods. Because they sign my paychecks when I'm not here, where every season is sports season. Now, if you guys haven't heard, the Rams are now completely stacked at corner. They have more quality corners than a suburban development. Man, they got keep to leave from the, Bron the Broncos, Marcus Peters from the Chiefs, and they just signed Sam Shields, who was recovering from a head injury, a uh, concussion and headaches injury he had, who was suffering from last year. They, we fr uh, the Rams franchise LaMarcus Joyner, and so that means Trumaine Johnson, their main number one lockdown corner, will has walked. He signed a five-year, $725 million contract with the Jets. Or did I say 720? I meant $72.5 million con uh, dollar contract with the Jets. Which, if you do the math, 
that is more that is that contract the Jets signed with Tremaine Johnson is way more than the entire projected Rams starting secondary. Kudos to Les Need, the Hollywood G- GM. Let's start that hashtag. Hashtag Hollywood GM. He's got the long flowing blonde hair. He loves out in Hollywood. He loves making big trades. This is his encore to the big trade with Tennessee last last summer. That's right. To get Jared Goff, who this year has paid off. There was a lot of question marks last year when Jared Goff was forced to sit. When that crazy Jeff Fisher doesn't know how to mentor a quarterback. Ugh. What's what's the opposite of a guru? Whatever the opposite of a guru, that's Jeff Fisher. He's a quarterback opposite of a guru. I guess a quarterback uh, squelcher, a quarterback. I don't know. But that man does not know how to coach quarterbacks. He just sucks the talent out of quarterbacks. Imagine what Steve McNair could have been with a good quarterback coach, a good quarterback system, a good, a, be, a great uh, offensive coordinator. But no, he got stuck with Jeff Fisher, the king of 8-8, eight and eight, the king of mediocrity, the king of let's run the ball on uh, first and 10, second and 10, third and 10. Let's not be exciting on offense. Let's just, let's just have an exciting punter so it'll give the defense good field position so that people can think I'm a good defensive head coach, defensive head coordinator. No, nah, none of that no more. The, the Rams had a great year on offense led the league in points per game got had the our, our uh the the team with the reigning offensive mpp and todd Gurley, defensive mpp and aaron donald and coach of the year sean McVay. the future is bright i don't know how you don't win a uh a super bowl or make a super bowl appearance when you have the best player on offense the best player on defense and the best uh man the best uh, best coach on the sidelines according to the media according to the, the the voters but the future is bright nonetheless the rams also traded alec ogletree and robert quinn they got rid of them and if we're being real last year's defense struggled to stop the run especially um down the middle between or off the, off the center, off, off the guards. And that's mostly Alec Ogletree's job. Yes, he's a he's a phenomenal. He did a good job in coverage, as well as Mark Barron. The, it's doubtful if the Rams are going to keep Mark Barron next year. We uh, The Rams and Wade Phillips try to do their best with Alec Ogletree. I think he's going to be very happy with the Giants. He is definitely more of a 4-3 inside linebacker. He actually, you know, started his career as a weak side outside linebacker and so he's not a good wasn't the best of fit fits in the Wade Phillips hybrid 3-4 system and neither is what Robert Quinn. Robert Quinn is a long defensive end. He is not a, an outside linebacker. He had a decently productive year. Let me get his sack totals up real quick. I believe he finished the year with, yep, nine. I was about to say nine. He had eight and a half sacks last year. So, and he was definitely starting to come along. I would say Connor Barwin and Aaron Donald definitely stole some of the sacks from him. Um, But those guys, Aaron Donald can play in any system. He's a beast. You can plug in Aaron Donald in any system, almost any position on the defensive line. And he's just going to ball out. Robert Quinn, I think, as we've seen, is a definitely a 4-3 system guy. He's young. He's only 27. So he has plenty of years to accumulate sacks. He'll think he'll be a great player with the Dolphins. The Dolphins have had a really good uh, track record for uh, creating good defensive line and good defensive pressures. I think both of these players, the Rams, uh, They'll have, you know, they're uh, clean. They're having clean breakups. It's a wasn't a messy breakup. It's just business. That's what I like about Rams. The Rams are getting it. This, this isn't St. Louis. 
This isn't Cleveland way back in the day before I was born, before my grandpa was born, my parents were born. Um, this is the Hollywood Rams. The Rams make trades. The Rams know how to to uh, to show some flair, to how to be exciting. And that's what we weren't getting out of Jeff Fisher. But we have it with Sean McVay now. Have it with Les Need. Les Need definitely gets it. He has a, a, a thing for the theatrics. And he and he's looked around. He's like, hey, wow. The Kings got Gretzky. The Lakers trade for Shaq. They traded for Kobe. Heck, the Dodgers a couple years ago traded for Gonzalez and Crawford. And don't, uh, Josh Beckett. And the Angels signed Albert Pujols. This is the town for big names. This is a big market. Yes, that stretches from Orange County to Los Angeles. Calm down, LA fans. The Anaheim. I know Anaheim. You guys hate on Anaheim. For and I, you know, I hate. I hate to I have to correct people to myself. Yo, Anaheim. I love Anaheim. It's not Los Angeles, but shout out to Anaheim. But Anaheim attracts a very similar crowd, not a similar crowd, but a, it's geographically a, a similar market. And so yeah, things are looking up for the Rams. They are going to be incredibly hard to stop. Uh, their defense, or they're going to be, it's going to be hard to get yards ex against them. Excuse me, they're going to be getting many, 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 many stops, many, many sacks, many interceptions. At least that's the expectation. You have numerous Pro Bowls. Between their cornerbacks, the Marcus Joyner is a up-and-coming defensive threat. You could plug him at nickel corner as well. He plays that free safety very well. He plays the nickel corner very well. They have Josh Johnson, who will be in his second year, uh, filled in as strong safety very well. And things, like I said, things are looking very, very well for the Rams. Excuse my stuttering. Just looking at my notes here. I just wanted to also remind you, if you didn't know already, that Endama Su has come in to visit. That can if can the Rams actually sign Endama Su? I don't know if they have enough cap room. I mean, they cleared Alec Ogletree's contract. They're getting rid of Robert Quinn. They still need to sign Aaron Donald, who who deserves a big deal. He held out. All of last uh, last season, didn't play till week two, and he still was the defensive MVP. That's incredible. That's more incredible than being drugged out a year later to playing in major PJ or in big PJ tournaments. I shouldn't say majors. We know those aren't major tournaments, but you guys get what I'm saying. Um, other news in NFL free agency. Let's be real. We only care about the quarterbacks. No, I'm just kidding. But we're going to focus on the quarterbacks today for the most part. I'm just going to give you guys the rundown and then tell you what I think about at the end. Kirk Cousins to Minnesota. Sam Bradford to Arizona. Tyrod Taylor goes to Cleveland from the Bills via trade. Case Keenum signs to to, uh, to Denver. Trevor Sinium uh, gets, leaves Denver, goes to Minnesota. Drew Brees re-signs with New Orleans. Josh McCown stays with the Jets. Teddy Bridgewater also signs with the Jets. Alex Smith is traded to Washington, and I believe that is it for quarterbacks. We'll get to some other news uh, just a second. So when the quarterbacks, quarterbacks obviously the biggest position to fill, the biggest paracletes to feel, fill in the NFL. There's 32 teams. But there's not 32 quality starters, let me tell you right now. Kirk Cousins, Minnesota, gets the biggest contract in the NFL, in the NFL history. But guess what? Aaron Rodgers is coming back next year. Chicago has Mitchell Trubisky, who I think can um, emerge as a quality starter for Chicago. Chicago has needed a quality uh Quarterback since geez, Sid Luckman. Don't give me any of that McMahon stuff. He wasn't a quality quarterback. He just got the job done with the the greatest defense of all time. Shout out 85 Bears. But yeah, Kirk Cousins to Minnesota. Although I think he will be productive 
He'll be a great fantasy quarterback. I do not see them winning the division next year. We know there's a lot of turnaround in the NFL. And like I said, Aaron Rodgers will be back. Trubisky is going to have is having uh, is going to have Allen Robinson, excuse me, I couldn't remember the name. Have Robinson behind him. It's going to have a quality running game with Jordan Howard and a much improved defense next year. Look out for the Bears. Look out for the Green Bay Packers if you're a Vikings fan. I don't think you guys repeat. You guys got lucky in the playoffs. Stephon Diggs balled out in that last play against New Orleans in the NFC Divisional uh, playoffs. But I don't think that success is to repeat. And I, I, I laid out my reasons. Do with the wonder will get in a fight with me on Twitter, Vikings fans. That Twitter again is at TD Gauchos, and the program's Twitter is at Medina Mondays. It's gonna be the Justin Kirk Cousins, and let's talk about the Cleveland Browns for a second. The Cleveland Browns are making moves, just like the LA Rams are. The Cleveland Browns potentially on offense would have. Tyrod Taylor is their quarterback. Let me, I can't remember their, uh, we have Jarvis Landry at receiver. Carlos Hyatt at running back. Not to mention their first round pick, Corey Coleman at receiver. And they're going to have, uh, sorry, Corey Coleman was 2016 first round pick. And they're going to have last year's first round pick, David Njoku, their tight end. So, are the Browns going to be good this year? I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not. I'm certainly not scared of that offense. I think the Browns, we know, are a garbage team in a eh, not the nicest city. Heck, even LeBron wants to leave Cleveland. Let's be real. So, oh, that's my phone blowing up. Someone edit that out. Anyways, so I'm not afraid of this new Cleveland offense. They're still going to need a quarterback of the future. Don't let anyone tell you different. They're taking a quarterback number one. If I was Cleveland, I'd take Sam Darnold. I don't, I'm not a huge Sam Darnold fan. I think he's the best quarterback in the draft. He certainly would um is has the body. He has the, has the same body as these other big NF, or excuse me, AFC North quarterbacks. He he he's a, like a tinier uh, Ben Roethlisberger. He has he has playmaker potential. He he does throw some interceptions. But he is a playmaker, and I think he had, he could be a quality starter in the NFL. Drew Brees resigning with New Orleans, recap that, was huge. Took a big discount. I, or Sorry, he took, I think he took a discount to, play, to stay with New Orleans. Uh, he had other offers, but New Orleans is, he's had success in New Orleans. The clock is ticking on him. Six foot quarterbacks, thirty seven and a and up, you know, that's not your bread and butter. But I think if anyone can succeed in this lead at that height, at that age, it's Drew Brees. He's thrown for four thousand yards in. I can't even remember the last time he didn't throw four thousand yards in a season. Yeah, see, I see, I have all these pauses, guys. I told you it's gonna be a garbage first podcast. Podcast. I can't even say podcast, right? But you know, it's episode one. It's only gonna get better. It's only gonna get smoother. The stats and info team is only gonna get better. Other teams in rebuild mode: the Seattle Seahawks, the Rams' number one enemy. Their arch enemies of the Pacific Northwest made plenty of moves. Man, you thought you would have thought they were the Cleveland uh, Cavaliers from from the trade deadline. All the moves they were making. They got rid of Michael Bennett, Richard Sherman, Cam Chancellor, and Cliff Averill. All major names. All major contributors in the Legion of Boom. Their defense is going to need a lot of help next year. Losing their number one corner, number one strong safety, and their two best edge rushers and, and pass, rusher, pass rushers. Uh, I will say that if you haven't watched a lot of Seattle games, if you're not a Rams fan, if you don't watch a lot of NFC West games, that Frank Clark... The backup 
defensive end. I think that kid can play. I think he he's projected right now to take over the starting role for Cliff Averill, who, if you didn't know, replaced Cliff Clemens a long time ago before that. So Frank Clark is long. He's long. As he, he fits that <clears throat> hybrid defensive end position that Seattle likes to play with. And last year he had nine sacks. The year before, ten sacks. And this past year, he was hurt a couple games, I believe. The, the whole defensive line for Seattle was banged up. So it was actually pretty impressive to see the kind of pressure Frank Clark, such a, such a generic name, sounds completely made up. But anyways, nine sacks in limited action is pretty good for the NFL. He's pretty young. He's becoming a savvy veteran. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think he he can fill some gaps on that defensive line. But you're losing Michael Bennett, a very underrated pass rusher. We know he's uh, one of those. He's a very outspoken gentleman. He uh, it believes, in, believes in his causes as well as Richard Sherman. And that was the interesting thing with all these moves that Seattle was making is people were wondering... Is this a them kind of revealing their colors, showing that we're okay with Richard Sherman and Michael Bennett and these guys taking a knee and starting protests and being very outspoken publicly, but with all these guys moving this simul- simultaneously, moving out fi- simultaneously, it raises a lot of questions. Maybe the front office isn't okay with it as much as they think. Maybe they are they just not a fan of that kind of political protest in the sports world. But regardless, they're all gone. The defense need to be needs to be reworked. Yeah, if you think about it, some of some of you guys have a good point out there. Hey, I'm not allowed to make a political stand at my place of work. I'm sure that's what these old let's face it, these primarily white ownership and and management must think or no maybe they don't not all of them but i'm sure a lot of them aren't necessarily fans of this type of display so but who knows i guess we won't know until until the 30 for 30 comes out what happened to the legion of boom you know it'll be about one super bowl super bowl big super bowl victory a down to the finished absolutely nuts super bowl loss and we guess we won't know till years later. So, yeah. Breaking news today. Jets acquired, they moved three spots up, acquired the number three pick for the number six, or and gave up the number their number six, the 37th pick, and the 49th pick to the Indianapolis Colts. That's a first and two second round picks. Now, that's a lot to move up only three spots, in my opinion. I think a lot of people, a lot of sports, uh, yeah, a lot of sports people, a lot of sports uh, writers and and uh, so-called experts probably agree with me that that's a hefty price for three picks. People, people uh, suspecting the Jets want to go quarterback, like we said earlier in the program. They signed Teddy Bridgewater. That's a big question mark. He's coming off a big leg injury. And Josh McCown is approaching 40. So, you know, what are you really going to do at quarterback in the next couple of years? A lot of people think they're going to take quarterback. Um, not Let's see, behind uh, in front of them will be the, their uh, cross-stadium, cross-locker room rivals. The New York Giants will be picking at number two. At number one, of course, is the Cleveland Browns. Always pick a number one, uh, Cleveland Browns. So a lot of people think they're going to take quarterback. A lot of people think they have their eyes or are okay with any of the top guys. I guess that'd be Darnold, Rosen, and Josh Allen. Lamar Jackson's stock has plummeted. His draft stock has plummeted. 
Uh, Baker Mayfield probably is not going to go until later in the draft. A lot of people think that New Orleans will draft him. I don't know if I necessarily buy that. Um, I, I rate, I've rated uh, Baker Mayfield myself as a pretty solid two second, third round pick. Um, so, yeah, that means that the Jets are su- suspecting. They are hoping that they can k- grab the second or third best quarterback in the draft because we know Cleveland has to take a, Cle- uh, a quarterback at that first pick. They just have to because if they don't get the quarterback situation right now, who knows how that problem is going to be solved. Quarterback's the hardest position to find a replacement. So the Jets want to find, apparently want to find their replacement this year. I'm pretty sure they're not going to try and go after, say, Saquon Barkley unless they know something about that we don't know about that uh, the Giants don't want to take Saquon Barkley or they don't want to trade out of that pick or pick the best uh, guard, the best lineman out of Notre Dame. That is, uh, offensive guard, I can't remember his name. Ah, Where's that stats and info team when you need him? Let's see. Anyways, so big news, big splash in the jet uh, in, in the in the draft draft order by the Jets, and let's move on to what you guys have all been waiting for to talk about is March Madness. March Madness brought to you by the Rhodium Open Air Market. It's March Mania at the Rhodium Open Air Market, California's open air market destination for over sixty five years. They're open three hundred sixty five days rain or shine the the rhodium open air market in torrance because again they signed my paychecks when i am not working here and we saw history that we will remember 65 years later down the road when umbc little university of maryland baltimore county number 16 seed in the tournament upset Number one seed, Virginia. I believe there was a poll floating around saying Virginia had the best shot to get knocked out as a number one seed. There were a lot of people saying and believing, I didn't necessarily believe this, definitely did not, that we would never see a number 16 knock off a number one. Not in this lifetime, not in... Your, your children's lifetime, not in your grandchildren's lifetime. And with the with the crazy things in sports, I've seen, I think I've seen crazier. Because as we know, a number 16, number one, or knocking off a number one seed in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty irrelevant. You have 64 teams in a tournament and essentially a top four seed knocking off a bottom four seed just isn't sure it's significant it's historical you might remember exactly where you were and i know i'm in the minority but i'm just not that interested let's be honest you weren't watching this game your friends weren't watching this game and for good reason you assumed, like all of us, Virginia was going to go on to the next round, face their mid-tier opponent, and they were going to take it from there. And then I, and so we all assumed this one is a lock. It The number 16 seed has not won a game in 135 previous contests against a number one seed. It was a done deal. But the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, that's right, shout out to Baltimore County, Retrievers knocked off the Virginia Cavaliers. And man, did they ball out. This is just another reason why I know you didn't watch this game. I know it. Or you didn't you didn't expect this to happen. Or not, not that you didn't expect this. You didn't know this was gonna happen. And when it happened, it's, it wasn't even that good quality TV. UMBC shot 54% from the field, 
and 50% knocking down 12 three-pointers from the field. And Virginia, terrible day shooting. Only 18% beyond the arc. And only shot 41% from the field. You live by the three, you die by the three. Not only that, that, but it's hard to say that Virginia wanted to be there. They were out rebounded 33 to 22. They lacked hustle in the second half. Didn't look great on offense like we talked about. But they, they just didn't even look like they really wanted to be there. They didn't look ready to play basketball. They didn't look like they wanted to play basketball. And that's why Jarris Lyles, 28 points, 9 for 11, 3 for 4 from downtown, and the Retrievers, Maryland, Baltimore County, upset. Number one, Virginia U. And just to put it in perspective how big an upset this was, only 2% of all the brackets, according to NCAA.com, picked UMBC to upset Virginia. If you were watching this game, you, you were thinking, man, tie game, 21-21 and a half. I wonder when Virginia's going to turn it around or, uh, you know, really... Actually, stop playing around. When are they gonna stop playing? Stop playing around and start playing basketball. Well, they didn't. And when you let a team that has nothing to lose into a game, bad things are gonna happen. Same thing with an animal. With some, when you when you corner an animal, they have nothing left to lose. That's the most dangerous thing that you can mess with. But like I talked about, you weren't watching this game. You weren't watching this game. You might have saw, you know, oh, Virginia's losing by 10. They'll figure it out. Oh, they're losing by 15. They'll figure with uh, 10 minutes left to play. They'll figure it out. At least that was my thinking. I was uh, watching some other games, doing some prep for this show. And you know what? Somebody didn't pass drama class. Somebody didn't tell UMBC that they wanted to get watched and not make the sport and just make sports center highlights. That they need to keep it close. What's up, UMBC? Keep it close. We'll watch your game. Now you're just a footnote. How uh UMBC absolutely destroyed Virginia. That was just a joke of a game. 20 points. You're the number one seed in a, in a basketball tournament out of 64. And you lose by 20? By 20. Frankly, frankly ridiculous. But anyways, enough of all that. There were plenty of other good games. In the tournament, it's March Madness after all. We had Syracuse beating TCU and Michigan State as a number three or number excuse me, a number eleven seed. They are tied for the lowest seed remaining with the Loyola University Chicago, who upset both Miami and Tennessee. Ramblers ramble on. These guys know how to play basketball and make it exciting for the folks. Clayton Cluster, I don't know if you guys saw it, hit the last minute shot after not a controversial play, but a close call. Weren't sure who went, went off if went off a Rambler or uh, went off uh, a Tennessee volunteer. Can't remember the gentleman's name, but Clayton Cluster, Clayton Custer, hit the last minute shot 
to put Loyola past Tennessee yesterday. And the ga- day before that, the game for that, Williamson made a great defensive play. Williamson for uh, Loyola made a great defensive play, knocking the ball loose, knocking it off a Miami Hurricane uh, offender, and gave Ingram the last minute shot from downtown with four seconds left to win it. We also had action from Nevada, who came back from twenty or came back twenty two points in the second half to upset number two Cincinnati. I don't know if you guys saw this game. There was a poor little uh, Cincinnati fan shedding a few tears. As a sports fan, sports fan, I can't say I've never been there. But to that young man out there, I know you're not listening. But if this reaches you, it's just a game, man. It's just a game. There'll be another one. There'll be another tournament. There'll be another day for the Cincinnati Bearcats. One of the best buzzer beaters of the tournament was freshman Jordan Poole hitting the last minute shot from Michigan against Houston. And here it is. And it's inbounding. So the pass is going to come from Livers. He rifles it right in front of us to Abdul Rahman at midcourt. Extra pass. And it goes for the win. The three pointer. Freshman has won it for the Wolverines. I just love that shot. Reminds me a lot of uh, Villanova, North Carolina, circa 2016. Very similar, very similar plays, very similar uh, design, very similar shot location. Looking ahead to the Sweet 16, a couple of the games I'll be really interested in. Uh, Taking a peek, checking the scores, will be number 11, Loyola versus Nevada. We talked about Loyola a little bit earlier in the program, how they upset upset Miami and Tennessee. Talked about that was some real drama there. So interesting how they will do. They're one of the remaining 11 seeds along with Syracuse. Be really interested to see number two taking on Purdue. Or number two, Purdue taking on number three, Texas Tech. And number five will be taking on who my uh, pick to win the tournament, Villanova. Villanova is absolutely destroying people right now. They took out Alabama 81 to 58 in the first round. No, excuse me, in the this past weekend. And in the first round, Radford felt the hand the heavy hand of Villanova. And took an L, eighty-seven to sixty-one. So those are guys. Those guys are my favorite to win the tournament. And the last game I'll be keeping an eye on is Texas A&M and Michigan, number three, number seven, Texas A&M, Texas A&M versus Michigan, and number three. Let's gonna see. We're gonna see if uh, Michigan can ride that momentum after that big buzzer beater against Houston. And uh, yeah, that pretty much wraps up our show, guys. Thank you all for listening to episode one of Medina Mondays with Henry J. Medina. I know it was pretty bad. It's only going to get better. Stick around. Stick through the growing pains with me. Just want to thank you all again for listening. Next week's show, we'll be doing our baseball preview. The Dodgers and the Angels will have opening day on March 29th against their both teams will be playing their Bay Area rivals, the Giants and the Oakland A's, respectively. So stay tuned for that. I will also be calling, providing commentary, live streaming on all channels, or probably my personal TD Gaucho uh, pages on social media. I'll be streaming commentary, uh, not commentary, broadcasting uh, the Clippers versus T-Wool games tomorrow at 5. And possibly next Sunday at 3, the Clippers are also playing uh, the Toronto Raptors. I would call some Laker games. I will be calling some Laker games in the future, but are those games the only games, basketball games that fit my schedule at the moment? And uh, maybe I'll throw in a March Madness game if I have time. We'll see what the work schedule allows. And also, next week, we'll also be talking more Ma- March Madness. Madness, oh my God. And uh, so yeah, shout out, to my, shout out to you guys, my first listeners. Thank you to my buddy Andy, 
Andy Zhang for the awesome logo and graphics designs. If you haven't seen our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, go check those out. Again, follow the program at those pages, at Medina Mondays and at TD Gauchos. That's my personal page. I told you earlier in the program, I am a proud Gaucho alum of UCSB. And most importantly, keep listening here on SoundCloud. Every Monday, I'll be uploading or, you know, I'll be working on some live streaming. Uh, the logist- We'll be looking into the logistics of that. Um, so stay tuned. Peace out until next week. Thank you all for listening. Have a great week.